If you are an entrepreneur, you are a business. Show up like a business. Treat yourself like a business. Respect yourself like a business. This is The Entrepreneur Way with Neil Ball. Unlocking the secrets of successful entrepreneurs seven days a week. Subscribe to our podcast and follow us on Twitter at Neil D. Ball. Napoleon Hill said the power of the mastermind is the driving force. To discover how you can unlock the potential in your business using the power of a mastermind, go to mastermindunlimited.com. And now, here is your host, Neil Ball. Hello, it's Neil Ball here. Thank you so much for joining me today on The Entrepreneur Way. The Entrepreneur Way is about the entrepreneur's journey. The vision, the mindset, the commitment, the sacrifice, failures and successes. I am so excited to bring you our special guest today, Annie P. Ruggles. But before I introduce you to Annie, I have a quote for you by Warren Buffett. The difference between successful people and very successful people is that very successful people say no to almost everything. The Entrepreneur Way asks the questions so we all get the insight, inspiration and ideas to apply in our businesses. Annie, welcome to the show. Are you ready to share your version of the entrepreneur way with us? Heck yes. <laughs> Heck yes. I've not had anyone answer like that for a while. It's always refreshing when I hear that. And thank you very <laughs> much for coming on the show today, Annie. It is my pleasure. Thank you for having me. You are very welcome and it's a pleasure to have you here. For almost a decade, Annie P. Ruggles has harnessed her Hulk-like disdain for hard sales, tacky self-promotion and overly competitive sleazeballs as aspirations to help people find better ways to grow their small businesses. She's guided hundreds of people towards making deeper connections, lasting impressions, and friendlier, more lucrative conversations and transactions. Annie, can you provide us with some more insight into your business and personal life to allow us to get to know more about who you are and what you do? Absolutely. So I run the Non-Sleazy Sales Academy, which means that I work with people who struggle to include themselves in their own success in the form of shying away from asking for the sale. So that is a lot of super small businesses like coaches, healers, and service providers, but they tend to get stuck in a never ending hamster wheel of just marketing and marketing and marketing and marketing, crossing their fingers and hoping the sales will come in. They won't. People need to be asked. And that's where I come in. I am based in Chicago. I am royally nerdy. Before recording, we had an entire conversation about snow. So if you're curious about <laughs> snow, feel free to PM me later. Oh, we sorted but, everything yeah. out, didn't we? Yeah. Oh, yes, absolutely. But that's me in a nutshell. I am a super nerd, bleeding heart empath who just wants to help other small businesses stay alive. Well, that's a noble cause, isn't it? To help other businesses stay alive. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I like that. So, okay, so you help other businesses stay alive and you've talked about sales and not being sleazy with your sales because some people have this opinion about selling and that may help hold them back. So is that, is that what your business is about? Is it just about helping people with sales or do you help them with other things as well? 
So I used to be focused on the marketing and branding side of things, and I yeah. still dearly love those things, and yeah. I still speak those languages. But the reason I am solely focused on sales mindset and sales tactics and sales strategy and customer service is because I noticed that my clients were getting stuck in the beauty and the shiny of marketing and not asking. And that is what I saw slow down my own business, slow down my client's business, waste time, waste money. And so I thought, you know what, I'm going to go all in on selling. Well, it's sort of more comfortable to sit there writing blog posts and doing Facebook posts rather than maybe asking for the sale and selling, isn't it? Of course it is. Of course it is. <laughs> Because it's shiny and exciting and new and intoxicating and you get that dopamine hit when you get a like on a post or someone shares something. And then, you know, it's got graphics involved. You can go on Canva and make yourself all this really pretty stuff. Like, yes, of course, marketing is more fun, but marketing and sales are not synonymous. Mm -hmm. So how did you end up where you are right now with the business that you've got with sales and helping people with sales? <laughs> well, was it always I'm this sure way? Most of your guests, no, it was not always this way. It was definitely a wild ride. Mm -hmm. uh, I first went into this industry at the beginning of my journey to be a life coach, uh -huh. which at the point in the U S was barely a thing. It was still a whole lot of confusion around what the word coaching meant. And if there was a sport involved, but I just knew I just wanted to help people. I just really wanted to use whatever was in me for the benefit of others. And so I thought, sure, I'll be this new thing called a life coach. And what I wanted to do was I wanted to make sure that if I was going to be a life coach, I was going to be the most successful life coach I could be. So I got very obsessed with marketing my own brand. And I started getting clients and I was like, wow, this is working. But what happened was that my clients wanted to know why and how my coaching business was profitable. They did not want me to go take them out on a swing set to talk about their feelings or whatever it was I was trying to sell at the time. So I thought, okay, I must have a natural talent. I certainly enjoy this marketing thing. Let's see how deep this rabbit hole goes. And that's how I wound up very accidentally falling into this beautiful bucket of marketing and branding for very small businesses, which I lived in for years and years and years. And I went, uh, it led me into software for five years. I was the director of marketing and sales for a software firm for a while, but my passion was always on really, 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 really tiny, tiny, tiny businesses. And when the software firm that I worked for was acquired, they chose not to take me. I consider that one of the greatest gifts of my life because it gave me the opportunity to go back into service of those small businesses. And I went right back to my roots, back to marketing, back to helping people with their shiny, beautiful things. But that's when I started to really see that if we do not cross the finish line of asking for the sale, all the marketing in the world just amounts to a bunch of shiny nothingness. Mm -hmm. What do you enjoy most about what you do? Celebrating the wins of my client. I sell, I sell, I send everybody that uh, signs on for my signature program. I send them a cowbell, mm -hmm. a little green cowbell. And it is so obnoxious. Like I would ring it right now, but your listeners would quit and never listen again. And that's not the well, role I think of you should. On a podcast. I think you should ring it. Are, are you sure? I'm sure. I, you've got us all curious now. Oh, that's a familiar sign. Yep. Nice little cowbell. But I send those out to everybody because I think it's so easy to get fixated, understandably, again, on the emotion of rejection or the sales that we don't get. But I also see the same people get a sale that they're really proud of for about two seconds. And I think that that is just backward. So I send all of my clients these little green loud bells so that they can ring them with a plum when they sell. And a lot of the time we do it together on Zoom. They'll be like, hey, can I get on your calendar just for a second? And I know what's coming. Mm -hmm. They just want to ring the bell together. And that is just pure 
unadulterated joy in my day to day life. Mm -hmm. Where did your idea come from to use cowbells of all things? I think they're loud. I think it's just the loudness. Like I was looking at different kinds of bells yeah. and the only other one that I could find that I could get in like a swag branded bell were um, desk bells, like the little ding, ding, ding okay. bells. Yeah. And I didn't want a ding, ding, ding. I made a sale. Ding, ding. I wanted, I made a sale. Clang, 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 clang. <laughs> I thought, all right, let's let's get rid of the dainty bell and go right to the big daddy. So you can't put it down now? Before you, I had to persuade you to even use it, and now you're picking it up involuntarily. Part of my hand. You know, it's like Sweeney Todd with his razors. I always have this little bell. What drives you to do what you do? I think my overwhelming misfiring empathy that started when I was a really little kid. When I was a really little kid and I would drive, obviously I wasn't driving, but you know, I was in the car and we would go by a business with a big going out of business sign. And as a kid, I would just burst into tears, just start hysterically sobbing. Didn't mm -hmm. matter if it was someplace where a little kid had no business being mm -hmm. like, you know, a gun store or uh, tax accountant people, whatever. I just saw that as the death of a dream. And I just hurt so badly for whoever was on the other side of that going out of business sign. And I just remember that so profoundly upsetting me as a kid. And it's that same upset that drives me today because I believe so much that so many people jump into entrepreneurship for all the right reasons, but they don't understand what they don't know. They don't understand what skills they don't have yet. They don't understand what to prioritize. And so too quickly, those dreams die. And now that as an adult, I've gotten to hear about how important these things are, the why and the what behind these dreams, I am just completely dedicated to crying less because more small businesses are dying. I'm trying to reverse that as much as I humanly can every single day. Mm -hmm. How do you relax when you're not working in your business? I cover myself in pets. <laughs> I have two cats mm -hmm. and a dog. They're my little island of misfit toys. Um, but I'm an avid crafter. I love to make gifts for people. And I read like the written word is going out of style. I read so much. I just nom, 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 eat it up. <laughs> Do you have any entrepreneurial role models? I'm very lucky that my entrepreneurial role models are my parents. So my mom, uh, both of them are retired now, but my mom is a Hall of Fame motivational speaker, Kathleen Passanisi. She is freaking amazing. But when I was 12 or nine or something younger, she really was like, oh, hey, free labor in my kid. And so I got to learn so much about the reality of running a small business by having a hand in my mom's and my dad is a retired small business strategist. And so I got to watch through him what it really takes to make an idea profitable and sustainable. And I'm so grateful for that. And my other entrepreneurial role models are the people that I was exposed to as a very young kid who are largely my parents' friends, like Karen Buxman, who's a really phenomenal nurse and healer and humorist, Lois Kramer, who helps people get speaking gigs. But for me, these were my aunts, my uncles, people that fostered my mother and were fostered by my mother, but also people that saw early talent and me and said, hey, you don't have to go into a corporate job. You don't have to go into a corporate path. You have skills that you can use on your own two feet. And I've really loved that. Annie, we've talked about your business and your personal life. Now what we're going to do is go back in time and talk about the time before you were an entrepreneur. What difficulties did you have to overcome when you started your business? I could not find my lane 
or my zone of genius for the life of me. Mm -hmm. I think I was following too many trends or trying to fit into like the new box of coaching. Like we talked about before, like, what does that look like? What does that mean? And so for many, many, I don't know, months, years, probably at the beginning of my journey, I did a lot of shape shifting and bouncing around and dabbling in things, which is great. Being a mad scientist with your brand is important. It's how you get things right. But I think it was just so challenging for me at the beginning to go, wait, how am I going to help people and who am I going to help and how am I going to do that? And what are the processes and how am I supposed to show up? I just did so much wibble wobbling at the beginning. Mm. I'm not sure how you can avoid that wibble wobbling at the beginning though, because ultimately sometimes part of discovering what you want is actually discovering what you don't want. Oh, heck yes. Absolutely. 100% true. And for me, You know, one of the things that really led to that was working for people whose ethics and integrity did not match my own. That was such a painful, challenging, difficult experience for me that happened more than once in my life. But without that knowledge, I would not be so passionate about integrity and values in selling now. It wouldn't even be on my radar. And I'm so fired up and so passionate about that now that I can't imagine that not being part of my life. But really, it was because of those first difficulties and some more recent ones that I have this crystal clear clarity around the fact that there's a lot of sleaze that needs to be undone. Mm -hmm. I think it's amazing when you take those types of experiences and you don't, you don't realize at the time the lesson in it or what you, how you can use that in the future. I mean, it's a bit like with someone like Steve Jobs when he went doing some random calligraphy course when he was at university and who would have thought that that would be the differentiator between Windows PCs and Apple PCs for quite a while where he was very, he wanted characters which were not in fixed positions where you could change the various aspects of a character and, and make them sort of beautiful and things. And that became something that became a strength, but you could never have known when he did that course that that was the case. And it's the same for anybody. You take all those disparate experiences and then later on you find that all of a sudden that wasted time all of a sudden becomes useful for you. Absolutely. It's all in how you dig into, explore and experiment with challenges and failure and setbacks. And also with just knowing yourself, you are your biggest business asset. You need to know yourself inside and out. And that is painful and chunky and takes a lot of work. But when, when what you understand of your market collides with what you understand of yourself. Ooh, that's such a beautiful opportunity to provide value. Did you have any doubts that delayed you starting your business? Oh, absolutely. freaking lootly <laughs> All the standard ones, okay? Is anybody actually going to buy this thing? Why would anybody listen to me? Am I good enough, smart enough, professional enough? Should I get a PhD before I open my mouth? Oh, we could talk about doubts for days. But yes, I had every single thing on the greatest hits of doubts. Absolutely. What mistakes did you make that slowed your journey? Lucy goosey boundaries. <laughs> oh, here's the thing. At the beginning, when we're talking about, it's understandable that you are going to be a little bit more desperate, a little bit more eager, and a little bit more loosey goosey with your boundaries because you're experimenting and you're trying things, right? You're pivoting, you're putting stuff on for size to see if people like it. You're bending over backwards to get your first clients, blah, blah, blah. All of that is good and noble and happens. But But what tends to happen when we're trying to convince those first sales is we'll say things like, well, in the future, dot, 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 I don't want to insert behavior here. But since I'm new right now, I will, you know, work on a Sunday, even though I promised my family I wouldn't, or I will severely discount this program to get it into your hands, or I will allow you to reschedule over and over and over and over and over and over, even though it keeps messing up my calendar. Because we feel like those are the debts we have to pay to society in order to get 
ahead, to get our foot out, like to get our foot in the door, to get our brand and our value into the hands of other people. But all of that is very important when you're new and when you're establishing yourself and in that experimental or growth, like first growth phase. But I think the big issue is we don't stop to reflect and say, my business is advancing, my boundaries need to shift. My boundaries need to become firmer. My self-protection needs to become more and how I show up needs to be changed because otherwise we just carry that, sure, I'll do it for you just this one time energy with us into businesses that are not new, that are seasoned, that have no business at all being so malleable. What are some of the things that you did before you started your business that would be helpful tips to some of the listeners who haven't yet taken the first step on the entrepreneur way? Become an insatiable student. If you know what your lane is, what your nerdery, what your zone of genius is, if you even have an idea of an inkling of what that is, I want you to go out and consume everything you can find on that lane and all of its cousins, right? So if you think you are an expert in Reiki, go out and learn about five different energy modalities and every possible thing about the history of Reiki. Become an expert. And the way that you do that is stand on the shoulders of the experts who have gone before you, who have laid out this treasure trove of information that is all around you. But before you jump into anything, whether it's brand new or you're pivoting, just bury yourself in the beautiful knowledge that is available to you. And we're now going to jump forward in time and talk about the time from when you became an entrepreneur. Do you think culture is important from the beginning in a business? Yes, in that. I think it's critically important that people understand what your business stands for and what your business stands against right from the beginning. And I think a huge part of that culture, whether you're a one person team or a 50 person team or a 5,000 person corporation is how you treat people. If that is infused in everything you do, if the quality and the caliber of care and customer service and how you view that customer is apparent, then I think you're on your way to building a very beautiful, thriving company culture ongoing. Knowing what you know now, is there anything that if you'd known it when you started out, that would have helped you to shortcut the learning curve? As I mentioned a little bit before, (laughs) marketing and selling are not synonymous. They are not the same thing. They are a relay where you have to pass the baton, right? The marketing team in your brain, if it's just you, has to turn things over to the sales team in your brain eventually, because otherwise you can get stuck in beautiful, shiny marketing for years until you run out of money. How much does gut feeling influence your decisions in your business? It impacts me a lot more than it used to because I have a strategy that I can cling on to like a skeleton. Mm -hmm. So if I follow my gut, if I take a risk, I know that I'm doing it in keeping with a greater goal and a set plan. Uh, So it allows me, honestly, by being more restricted, it allows me more freedom to follow my gut instinct because it's not going to be wildly off course. What makes you uncomfortable as an entrepreneur? What makes me uncomfortable? Yeah. Sleaze. That's why I have the non-sleazy sales academy. I still don't love competition. I certainly don't love rejection, but those are just parts of the battle. But what I really don't love and what makes me extremely uncomfortable is when I hear the horror stories of how other people have been sold to by people that have earned their trust. Mm -hmm. That makes me absolutely bonkers. And the other thing is sales gimmicks, like urgency and scarcity and all those things have value and they work really well. But when it's fake, it just (laughs) makes my 
skin crawl. It makes me so unbelievably uncomfortable that good people feel like they have to resort to these nasty tricks because mm -hmm. that's what they are. Yeah. You never know, you never know though, do you, with these, with these sorts of scarcity things where when the timer runs out, this offer is going to disappear. You just don't know. <laughs> you just don't know. But most of the time you're right. You go and you're like, wait a minute. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and that's true. That's true. We need to help people get past inertia. Yeah. That's why urgency and scarcity and all of these things work. Mm -hmm. But if you're just making someone feel an emotion to get them to click buy, yeah. mm, why can't it be truly rare? Why can't it be truly limited? Why can't it be truly special? If it's meant to be special, make it special. Don't just fake it mm -hmm. being special. What do you think are some of the secrets to success? Oh. <sighs> The secrets to success oh, yeah. that I see are consistency, tenacity, and self-awareness in that you have to be consistent. Oh, man, I wish I had gotten the gist of that earlier <laughs> when I was younger. But you can't just shout something off the, mar the mountaintop once and expect everyone to glom to you. Consistency, consistency, consistency. And the idea of how quickly you can spring back and how you can protect yourself after you get those rejections, those no's, after you lose those opportunities, after you have a challenging customer service situation. When a business hits a snag, it's all about how you bounce back from that. But the more consistent you are, it does make it even easier to get back and find your footing. Life is made of constant change, whether we like it or not. And many people say that the only constant in life is change. Annie, how do you try to keep up with change? I try to keep my eyes open and my ears open. I try to keep my awareness and my finger on the pulse of what is happening so that I can not predict the change, but lean into what parts of the change are right for me. But I also really love, just as importantly, to keep the thread of what remains. A lot of what I teach is very old school. Right. Like one of my favorite sales books was written in the 50s and I sort of treat it like a Bible now. Uh, but I love when in the face of change to look at what is changing and evolving and how I can play a part in that and how, you know, that's going to change my life. But it's just so beautiful to go. All right. But what stays the same? Relationship marketing stays the same. Mm -hmm. The need for trust stays the same. Exemplary customer service stays the same. So I like to take both of those pictures and say, OK, we're heading to a new horizon. These seem to be the trends, but I'm bringing along these greatest hit skills that I've acquired along the way. Mm -hmm. I think ultimately technology changes the, the sort of processes might change, but the principles underlying them, they stay pretty much the same, don't they? I mean, it's about human Absolutely. behavior. Absolutely. It's about human behavior, how you treat other people and how you treat yourself. Yeah. That's never going to change. Mm -hmm. What is your favorite book on entrepreneurialism, business, personal development, leadership, or motivation? And can you tell us why you have chosen it? I desperately love the book To Sell is Human by Daniel H. Pink. It is the first book that I ever read about selling that didn't make me want to cry in the shower because I felt so gross. I think it is such a human, I mean, it's called To Sell is Human, but I think it's such a fair understanding of the need for selling, but also the hesitations of selling. And I love, love, love one of the core ideas, which is ABC always be closing is outdated. And so instead, Daniel Pink wants us to focus on attunement, buoyancy, and clarity. And focusing on those three things for me has made all the difference. Attunement is keying into what your prospects are thinking. I teach a lot of emp like my my own program is called Sales for Empaths. I focus a lot on empathy, but his is on attunement, aligning to what they're thinking. Buoyancy 
which I already talked about, how quickly you bounce back, and clarity, which is the knowledge and perception to understand what is happening deep in the bowels of your business. Folks, when you have a busy life, listening to audiobooks is a great way to expand your knowledge in the time when you may be doing other things, such as driving or when you are at the gym. We have a special offer for you of a free audiobook of your choosing. To choose your free audiobook, go to www.freeaudiobookoffer.com. As long as you've not already signed up, then you will qualify. Annie, are you ready to speculate about the future? Ah, uh, yeah. <laughs> of course you are. What one thing would you do with your business if you knew that you could not fail? I would throw the biggest, weirdest solopreneurship con uh, convention. I almost mm. said concert. Sure. Why not? Make it a concert. Entrepreneurship concert. Weirdest, yeah. <laughs> I'd throw the weirdest thing ever. I would just have it be this giant parade of nerdery on mm -hmm. display. There would probably be cosplay. There would definitely be music. But yeah, I would just throw just an epic and ass, like ostentatious, jam-packed with value, but not like anything else you would attend kind of event. What skill, if you were excellent at it, would help you the most to double your business? I am horrible at delegation. Shout out to my assistant, Georgia, for keeping me sane. I That girl has to beg me to give her stuff to do. Mm -hmm. If I could get better and not be so precious about areas of my business, if I could get better about delegation, I would literally get twice as far because I would have twice as much time. Mm -hmm. So why don't you do that then? It's an acquired skill that I am still perfecting. <laughs> mm -hmm. But you could help twice as many people. Yeah. Yeah. So bye. It's new to me. I've only just recently brought on team members. It's yeah. very, very new to me. And so I'm learning to relax my grip on every single cog and every single facet of my business. It's, it's a gradual, a gradual, I made up a word. You did. It's a gradual loosening of my control freakedness that I cannot wait to continue to explore. Mm -hmm. In five years from now, if a well-known business publication was publishing an article on your business after talking to your customers and suppliers, what would you like it to say? I would love for it to say that I have reframed selling as an act of service and that it has made a difference in the survival of their small business. Oh, that would make that little girl who used to cry at going out of business signs. I would be so proud. I couldn't even say to be the godmother of businesses that live and thrive past challenges. Oh, oh. <laughs> I'd frame it, I'd tattoo it, I'd put it on my tombstone. Annie, it's now time for three golden nuggets. What is your favorite quote and how have you applied it? So the correct version of my quote has a potty mouth word in it. So you're going to have to guess what the potty mouth word is because okay. I'm going to bleep it. Oh, right. Okay. But uh, my most cherished mentor, my personal Dumbledore, Sheldon Patinkin, is very famous for saying, it's better to be a bleep hole than a chicken bleep. <laughs> it's better to be a bleep hole than a chicken bleep. And what that means is make choices, dare, do the thing. Take the leap because you don't get more opportunities. They don't just grow in trees and fall over. You know, you just have to make them. You have to go out, be tenacious and take it. Even if you're a good, wonderful, loving person, even if you struggle with receiving, you still have to make the choice, make it bold, make it loud and make it now because we don't have time to waste. So, yes, it's better to be a bleep hole than a chicken bleep. 
Okay, so everyone's got to send their answers in now as to what they think those two words are. <laughs> <laughs> That's totally fine. Feel free to DM me your choices on Instagram or if you want to know. I have no problem swearing in DMs, but I'm not going to swear on your show, Neil. <laughs> Do you have any favorite online resources you can share with us that will be useful for other entrepreneurs? Did you know that your public library has audiobooks and ebooks? A lot of people that I talk to do not know that. So I, as a voracious reader, swear by sites like Blinkist who have audio summaries. Mm-hmm. Oh. Audio summaries are my best friend in the world because it shows me what books I need to read. It's not a replacement for books, but it is, you know, a beacon of, whoa, this person's really saying something. I got to get that book. But also you have the access through your library, wherever you live, to a sea of ebooks and audiobooks just waiting for you for free. Get a library card. Every single entrepreneur should have a library card. Mm-hmm. Do you know, someone else has said that to me in the past, and I had to actually go and check to see if my local library still existed. <laughs> it's that long oh since I've been to it. I think it's about 30 years. <laughs> That's depressing, Neil. <laughs> this has been a very motivational show, and now you're going to depress everyone about the death of libraries. Yeah, but it's to the benefit of... Amazon or Audible when I've I've gone and bought books as a result of it. So it's not as if I'm not reading. Right. Yeah. Right. Well, I'm guessing your library is alive and well. It is. I I did. Last time I checked, it was. Yeah. Go find it. And also, a lot of libraries have forgiven fees. So if you're worried about returning to the library because you aren't sure what you owe, Mm -hmm. it might not be so bad. I didn't know that. Well, there you are. What is your best advice to other entrepreneurs? You are not a nonprofit mm-hmm. unless you're a nonprofit. If you overly sacrifice yourself through ask avoidance, through loosey goosey boundaries, like we talked about, through uh, over delivering as a Uh, negative. I don't mean over delivering in the way that we all aspire to with customer service. I mean, really over delivering and not demanding what you earn, what you deserve, what you're entitled to, what you're worth, then you are going to allow other people to slow the rate of your business for their own gain. And you will keep yourself small. Do not do that. If you are an entrepreneur, you are a business. Show up like a business. Treat yourself like a business. Respect yourself like a business. Thank you for that. And I've learned a new phrase, ask avoidance. Yeah. I like that. Folks, feel free to use it. I am going to. I was thinking about borrowing it from you. Folks, if you didn't manage to get a note of Annie's favourite resources or her favourite book, you can find the links on Annie's show notes page. Just go to theentrepreneurway.com and search for Annie or Annie P. Ruggles in the search box. Annie, is there anything else you would like to add about your business? If you are ask avoidant, If you are sales avoidant, number one, it's not your fault. You've been sold to freaking terribly. So practice some self-forgiveness and head over to my free masterclass, which is called Making Selling Easy Without Getting Sleazy. It has some mindset reframes and stuff in there, but also some very practical tips on handling objections and dealing with no's, not now's, and the whole nine. And the other thing is, if you, like me, are a multi-passionate nerd, please check out my own podcast, Too Legitimate to Quit, Instantly Actionable Small Business Strategies with a Pop Culture Spin, where I interview whip smart people in the small business space about what small businesses need to focus on and then we glean uh, lessons and tips and tools and tricks from our favorite pieces of pop culture so if that sounds like something you'd enjoy please check it out wherever you listen to podcasts
Annie, thank you very much for that. And thank you for coming on the show today and telling us about your journey and how you've got to where you are right now or on that journey. We've gone back in time and you've shared some of your experiences with us. You shared some of your thoughts about what it takes to be a successful entrepreneur. And you've also given us some great tips as well. And you've even given me some new phrases. So thank you very much for coming on the show today. Oh, the pleasure is all mine. Thank you so much, Neil. You are very welcome. And thank you. Folks, you have been listening to Neil Ball chatting with Annie P. Ruggles on The Entrepreneur Way. If you have enjoyed the show, please share it on social media and subscribe to our email on The Entrepreneur Way website. Also, please add your comments on Annie's show notes page on The Entrepreneur Way website at www.theentrepreneurway.com and search for Annie P. Ruggles in the search box. Thank you for listening. And until the next episode tomorrow, goodbye. Thank you for listening to The Entrepreneur Way. Subscribe to our podcast and follow us on Twitter at Neil D. Ball.